I'm on the outskirts of uh, Liège. Um, I'm visiting one of the 12 forts from the beginning of World War I. Now, this fort has a significance in two things. First of all, a secret weapon that was developed by the Germans and used on this place, and uh, a material that proved to be a design fault at that time this fort was built. Let's go and see what it's all about. We're at a place called Fort de Lonsin um, in Belgium. It's one of 12, what do you call, uh, Brelmont forts that surround Liège uh, to defend, its, uh, defend itself. Um, these forts were built between 1881 and 1884. Um, this particular fort was attacked between, I think it was the 5th and 16th of August 1914, and one of the very first um, advances by the German army onto the um, uh, city of Liège in Belgium. One of the reasons that was because um, the Germans were using something called the Schlieffen Plan, which is um, they wanted to attack France through Belgium and then hopefully surround it and France would actually theoretically um, surrender. But that never happened. But this fort um, has got quite a lot of history to it and regarding its design and what happened to it and why it exploded and why it, and it never gave up. Now normally uh, fortifications previous to this one were built out of masonry, uh, brick and cement really. But the Belgians were experimenting with a new type of um, product. Um, they thought that um, it would probably be easier to build and uh, would take not as long as um, a bricks and mortar would. And the new material was called concrete. Now the problem is, is um, concrete was very new to the Belgians and no doubt to the world probably uh, and the way they've mixed it and where they uh, where they used it and how they, um, how they built the buildings out of it and this floor design was one of the reasons why this fort was destroyed. I'll tell you more about that later on let's go through the fort and have a look at what fortifications it's got and how it was designed. Uh, to the right there that is the barracks or the uh, cent central massif mound as they call it um, you can see some holes there that would be from infrared fire and uh, this is where they were billeted barracks were billeted you can see where the things are there the uh, chimneys are there so i'm assuming the barracks were on that side where the men were sort of staying and obviously inside this building here where they've been working the guns and doing different jobs and um, fixing things and that and then when you need to go to the toilet they came across here there's toilets down there there's a wash basins, there's a, a place where they can sit for recreation. Uh, there's a place where they can uh, get something to eat. There's a, a, a butcher's there and there's a baker's there. They also call the central massive, um, or the centre massive or mound, the central citadel. Coming to what they call the counter scarp area, it seems to be where the men relax and they can have, um, um, they've got butchers here, they've got a baker's here, and this is um, the area that I think they, they just lived in really. Now, this section from there to there. Uh, they call it a ditch, obviously. It's six metres high, roughly about 20 foot, uh, by about 26 or eight metres uh, wide. Uh, and it's sunk into the actual landscape, so there's less chance of the enemy seeing it, hopefully less chance of the enemy actually attacking it.
is the uh, barracks. This is where the uh, soldiers were uh, uh, would stay to defend the fort and to use all the uh, equipment inside there. Uh, apart from there's two gun emplacements here to defend uh, the fort itself and one to defend the postern. Before you go into the fort, this is the only way in and out. It's the back of the fort. It's called a postern. I think how it's pronounced. Um, it's got metal gates there. It's got a drawbridge there where the cat is, if you can see it to the right hand side. And it's a four metre drop down there. It's got um, observation firing slots for small arms. Observation again, and possibly firing slots for small arms. Both sides. And again, pointing towards the fort itself, it's got another um, possible loophole, loophole and that side as well so it's got some defense um, before you actually get onto the fort itself you were attacking it also apparently just where that uh, mound is there there was a 5.7 centimeter gun as well so you imagine coming down here trying to attack this place you're going to be under some fire The majority of weaponry is actually in what they call the central massive, the uh, central mound, which is behind me. We're going to have a look at that in a minute. Uh, it consists of uh, quite a few weapons. It had two 21 centimetre howitzer turrets, Grusenwerk Krupp, a range of 9,400 metres or 10,300 yards. One double 15 centimetre turret, two double 12 centimetre turrets, four single 57 millimetre gun turrets, Grusenwerk, one observation turret with a search light. Nine rapid firing 57mm Norden with field guns at a range of 36 rounds per minute. Eventually, that Nord with and field gun became an anti tank weapon later on in the war. Uh, that's a lot of firepower for a little fort like this. The fort isn't that big, to be honest with you, not compared to um, uh, Eben em Emil, but that was again mainly Second World War. This one was pre World War, but they used it in the First World War. This is uh, one of Germany's new siege guns. 420 millimetre calibre, which is twice as big as the Belgians had. It's called Big Bertha. And its range was 9,300 metres or 30,500 feet. You imagine a series of these firing down. If you're in this fort here and it's firing down constantly for God knows how many days, um, you're constantly being shelled by a, a shell that's twice as big as your own shells. The biggest at the time the Belgians had was 21 centimetres, which is 210 millimetres, isn't it? Um, where this was 420 millimetres, twice as big. Uh, and eventually, this fort, or I should say, this gun, or one of these uh, shells, hit the ammo depot. Brailmont, who designed this um, fortification, um, died in 1903. So we never ever saw what happened regarding how this fort was destroyed and the uh, and the type of concrete it used and how it was laid. Um, he also, believe it or not, uh, on the uh, Eben Emil and the four forts around um, the. Um, uh, around uh, Liège, which is further to the um, towards the Netherlands area, um, he even give um, ideas to the government of where these could be placed. But luckily enough, I think the Belgian government had uh, realised what happened to this um, to this type of fort and readjusted uh, how they uh, actually mix the concrete and what they actually put into it to make it stronger. Now all the forts around. Uh, Liege, these type of Bremont forts are, uh, regard, are about um, seven kilometres apart, which is about 4.3 miles away from the uh, city centre of Liege, and they're about that same distance from each other. Um, I think each of these forts could actually fire onto each other, very similar to um, the stuff on the Maginot line. And also, they had a signal, they had a, a light signal, something like Morse code, I would say, so they could communicate with um, both the fort at the front of them and both the fort, the fort at the back of them. Now I'm walking down one of the uh, 
the uh, part of the isosceles triangle, which is the same length as the other side of here, which is about 235 metres, or about 771 feet. It's about, as I said before, about 20 foot deep and about 26 foot wide. This again is the damage done from a 420 millimetre shell. Now, if you look at the, uh, the holes, these holes here, and there, and that side here, they had machine guns and small arms. And what they, they did, what they call enfilade fire. In other words, they fired across the, uh, to the other side of the fort, just in case any enemy were coming up where the ditches are. So they were firing that way, they were firing that way. They also had a thing called a shot trap. Now, I'm not sure if this is a shot trap or not. Now the building bends here on the corner. I think the idea was if you were firing down one of these sides here, they were actually it would actually ricochet and try and catch any sort of um, enemy attacking on the opposite side where you probably can't see. Now I mentioned the guns uh, and armament in this building and this, um, this um, fortification, but what I forgot to mention was the ones that were uh, Krupp, uh, as in manufacturers, were actually German uh, with 4.7 centimetre guns inside this um, outer bastion here. See the holes there? Um, they defended, as I said, enfilade fire that way and uh, down there as well, just in case the enemy came along this ditch. One of the guns is um, still here. There's the front of the gun and it's well set back out of the way. It only has one direction, it can't really traverse that much to be honest with you or even elevate that much, but at least it can fire down this, um, uh, this ditch and you can see it's actually set into a uh, um, a, um, a crinelle, the German, uh, the um, uh, the French used to call it, but it's Belgian, so it's still uh, a loophole. Um, if you go inside this uh, outer bastion, uh, part of it's made into a crypt for 43 soldiers that have obviously been recovered, and they're now actually encrypted inside this uh, building here. You can go along and pay your respects. We're going to go up these stairs here to the top of the central massive or mound and we'll see exactly what happened when a 420 millimeter German Big Bertha shell hit this and they'll also explain the faults with the concrete uh, at that time when it was first laid. So you can see the devastation of what a, a 420 millimeter how it's a shell did on this area between the 12th and 15th of august a shell a 420 millimeter shell hit that central massive where the concrete is just below it was a um, ammo dump one of two and it blew the ammo dump completely up causing all this devastation the problem was the Belgians had was uh, concrete was a, a new type of material they just started to use. Everything else be previous to that was built with um, sand, lime cement, mortar, stuff like that. And um, they didn't know how to sort of build something like this regarding, uh, uh, regarding it make it much stronger than the, uh, the bricks and, uh, and sand and cement. So they were experimenting. The mistakes they made were this. First of all, when they were laying this concrete down, by the time it got dark, they didn't um, pour any lighting out to carry on pouring, so it all poured as one fixed amount of concrete. So in the morning when they come again to um, lay the rest of the concrete, then there was a, obviously a fault in it. So there was obviously a joint between 
the bottom concrete and the top concrete and every many layers they poured secondly and I think most importantly they didn't understand about reinforced bar they didn't put any reinforced bar in here so as these are it's just, these these uh, shells were hitting it we're just taking layers and layers off it and eventually got down where it was that thin it just penetrated the actual um, concrete and, and blew the um, magazine up below it and more than likely thirdly is the mayor as far as I would say not understood about how you get sand cement chippings together by vibrating or tampering it tampering it down in other words to get the bubbles out now in later fortifications second world war just before like for instance um, Fort Eben Emil that would have been a much tougher um, fought to destroy because it had probably been poured at the correct time with no doubt in one pour and most importantly it had reinforced bar running straight through it. This is what's left of uh, Belgium's biggest gun, a 21 centimetre um, gun. There's nothing left of it at all and no doubt it was actually destroyed in the uh, war against Liège that the Germans were uh, pursuing and as I said before this was the biggest gun they had at the time the Germans invented the Big Bertha 420 millimeter howitzer which they didn't know about and that's what happens when a shell hits it like that this fort uh, out of the 12 forts surrounding Liège was the one, only one that never gave in uh, after seeing the destruction, the devastation of uh, what happened here, then the other forts uh, would have given because they've realised that the uh, German shell was twice as big as their own and this fort was never designed to um, um, cope with such a big shell, only the size of the shell the Belgians had, which was 21 centimetres or 210 millimetres. This is one of the... Uh, Gusenwerk Krupp uh, rotating uh, rising turret, turret sorry um, 21 centimetre guns which you can see one there slight protruding out has raised about 30,000 feet I think it were roughly the same distance as the as the Berthas um, but ironically um, this was a this was designed and built by uh, a German company Krupp went on to the Second World War to, to, to build one of the biggest guns that um, Germany ever had, which was the Krupp K5, and also um, the, the, the Swa Gustav, which is another massive railroad, both railroad guns. Uh, one went on a single track, and the other one had to have double track, because it was that big. Now, the thing with um, these rotating guns in a fixed position, they needed outpost to... Um, obviously find out where the enemy were coming from then rel relay it back into a, uh, a central command and the central command would give it uh, elevation and um, traverse uh, directions of where to fire the gun then obviously it's relied on the outer posts to make sure that it was hitting the target the problem they had with these type of uh, not the guns itself but the stuff they were using was called black powder now black powder cre creates a lot of black smoke and it must have filled this garrison it must have been so difficult, but luckily enough, uh, they had a, 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 a mechanical extractor fan, so no doubt somebody were working that to try and get rid of all the fumes and all the noxious gases and stuff like that. Um, more modern weapons, especially the Second World War, started to use uh, smokeless gunpowder, which, as it means, it's smokeless, not quite smokeless completely, but um, it's much more cleaner than the black smoke that they used to use, especially on this fort. See one of the holes there that the howitzer made. After the complete destruction of this uh, fort, it became a, a, a propaganda machine for um, the Germans, showing off their new 420 mm howitzer gun, Big Bertha as they called it. This was one of the um, uh, rotating turrets that wasn't destroyed, you can see that. It's in good condition. So the Germans were pretty accurate at bombing the middle of it because they'd know that's where the soldiers would be the most anyway and they would know that the um, the, um, uh, the armoury would be below there somewhere they wasn't sure how far it was down I think the concrete was only about 13 foot thick on top 
and then the side walls were what five or six foot thick because they thought there was less uh, chance of destroying a sidewall than the top of it but when you're hitting it with something like an howitzer then it's going straight up and straight down in that explosion there was 350 uh, soldiers killed instantly and the vast majority are still buried under this um, concrete so as I normally do I'm going to place a cross down as close as I can to where the uh, the shell or the uh, the casemate actually blew up as a sign of respect Besides being a museum, this is also a war grave. So if you come here, um, just show some respect. But then if you're interested in stuff like this, like me, you will do anyway. I think this is where the um, shell hit the um, concrete here and penetrated down to the... Um, ammo dump and uh, subsequently with the explosion of the actual shell itself plus all that uh, munitions it created such a devastating effect as you can see that looks like the outer ring of where the uh, turret would have sat that's how much it's, uh, it's knocked it out of its um, positioning Now what you're looking at actually would have been the other side of the uh, uh, the isosceles triangle and uh, that crater there was cre was caused by the explosion of uh, the um, ammunition and it's blew it all the way up here and it's actually covered the uh, the escarpment look down here it carries on down here and then it starts again they said that the 12 forts that were built to protect Liège that this was a better equipped fort and the other forts didn't have um, they had toilets but they didn't have toilets that were equipped for it and the other forts didn't have um they had toilets and that but they didn't have no way of ex ex getting rid of the fumes and stuff and all the smells but apparently here uh, it were equipped with um, ventilation to try and keep this uh, this fort as nice and fresh as possible for the soldiers In 2003, there was that much unexploded munitions here, the Belgian government classed as a hazardous um, area. In 2007, the Belgian government came in and cleared all this of um, shells and ammunition. 2,500 shells they found equated to about 142 tonnes. And then they cleared of the mines, um, they found 25 bodies. Uh, they managed to identify four of them, but all the bodies now are in the uh, crypt at the at the front of the fort itself since 2008. Since the 15th of August 2014 this area has been classed as a war grave and a place of remembrance. There's 300 bodies, bodies still buried underneath there which have no chance of um, recovery. Um, so this is a place of obviously remembrance and when you come here and you look around and um, you're contemplating and listen to this which you get as part of the, the entrance fee which tells you all about Fort de Lunts in anywhere. Uh, it's a sign of respect and hopefully you'll find it of interest. Well thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you on the next video.